So as we all know, Canada uh, relies on immigration, uh, not only to drive population growth, but also for our economy. We know that our fertility rates are low, our, uh, we live in, in an aging population, there are extreme labor shortages, and uh, without immigration, we wouldn't be able to sustain uh, our economy. So it's really important that we uh, uh, pay extra attention to the employment integration and economic integration of immigrants once they arrive. So as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen that there have been extreme labor shortages across different sectors and industries. And one response from the federal government has been to increase uh, the intake of Im immigrants over the next three years. So the plan, uh, which was just released last week, is to uh, integrate 485,000 new immigrants in 2024 and to increase that number up to 500,000 for 2025 and 2026. At a provincial level, we know that the provincial nominee programs have also been increasing their intake and looking to um, um, supplement uh, their labor force in uh, targeted areas. In Ontario, uh, which is where I'm from, we, uh, the federal, or sorry, the provincial government has um, um, created uh, uh, priority areas, priority sectors uh, to increase with healthcare being one, but also across different industries and trades as well. So this is all, uh, helpful and, and these strategies and responses are um, the right ones, but what happens when immigrants arrive? Well, what we know and, and everyone here uh, I can attest to is that immigrants do face challenges finding commensurate employment once they arrive. And by commensurate, we mean employment that matches their skills, education, and qualifications. Many are uh, less likely to be employed in uh, their chosen professions. They often work in low skilled and precarious types of employment. Now, employment is a complex process and it includes a range of community services and engaged political and economic systems. And so when we talk about employment integration, we know that it isn't a simple pathway, one single pathway into employment for all immigrants. We also know that integration occurs locally and that regionalization policies across the country have redistributed the immigrant populations away from large cities towards smaller uh, urban centers. In, nine, in 2022, Statistics Canada reported that 90% of immigrants resided in one of Canada's 41 census metropolitan areas, but those CMAs do vary in size and so that's an important point to know. We also know that in 1980, 75% of recent immigrants were settling in one of Canada's largest urban centers, so Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, but by 2021, this proportion has decreased to just over 50%, which is also important to note that regionalization policies are working. Those immigrant patterns have shifted and they have shifted toward smaller and mid-sized cities across the country. But what that means is that we have um, pressures placed on these smaller and mid-sized cities uh, to integrate immigrants once they arrive. We know that with the research, recent research uh, shows that empl immigrant employment um, is primarily focused on the three largest cities with less research on uh, small and mid-sized cities. The studies that do exist around employment integration in small and mid-sized cities uh, suggest that immigrant employment outcomes are better uh, in smaller urban centers. However, less is known about how immigrants integrate uh, into these cities once they arrive. The other important thing uh, to note is that current policies and practices often place responsibility on the individual to integrate into employment. So there are large investments into bridge training programs across the country. However, these training programs create a narrative that immigrants are deficient and need to upskill or change, um, change their uh, employment trajectories to meet the needs of the local economies, which may be uh, something that's of interest to some immigrants, but we know that many, after having interviewed them, uh, are not interested in fully changing uh, their profession once they arrive. So for this particular study, we chose to take a systems level approach to understand uh, how immigrants integrate into local economies. 
Um, the argument really was that there's a need to shift the focus away from the individual and to examine the larger system as a whole to identify challenges and opportunities and gaps in services where uh, we can improve the services available to immigrants and to help them integrate into communities efficiently, effectively, and with productive employment. So the purpose of the study was to examine employment integration of recent immigrants in one mid-sized city, and we did a case study of the city of Guelph, uh, which is in the southwestern uh, region of Ontario. The term employment integration uh, was defined as the process of uh, entering the labor market efficiently, effectively, and with productive employment. And that was sort of the guiding framework for uh, the creation of this study, the design of the study. So why we chose the city of Guelph? Well, Guelph is an interesting case study because it is a mid-sized city, about 165,000 people live there, just over 165,000. It is one of the fastest growing cities uh, in the province of Ontario, and it's seen quite an increase uh, in the growth of the immigrant population, currently at 22% of the total population. But what was of particular interest about the city was that it has the lowest unemployment rate across the country. And so arguably, it is a place where if uh, people are looking for employment, they should find employment and they should be able to integrate uh, into employment rather quickly, uptake of employment should be quick. So we decided that this was the proper, the best case to analyze employment integration of newcomers. The city itself is, um, it does have a university, so which also brings in uh, some diversity. And it is a city that's largely driven by manufacturing, which was an interesting um, uh, variable to uh, our analysis when we examined the city. Now the design and methods that were used, it was a case study design, um, but it also included a stakeholder analysis, uh, interviews with key actors, uh, which then generated a systems map, which I'll show in one of our findings slide. And the systems map, what it does is it displays the current system as it exists. It shows the connections and the relationships between those key actors. And it also provides then a snapshot of where there may be gaps at a certain point in time and how to, and how to fill those gaps in terms of services for uh, uh, integration. Then we also conducted interviews, semi-structured interviews with 20 immigrants, recent immigrants uh, who were, had just uh, moved to the city of Guelph and were looking for employment and or were employed. And I'll present some key findings. It's a very high level uh, uh, summary of what we found. Um, there will be uh, uh, more information shared later tonight in poster session if everyone, anyone is um, here at the conference. So here's a system, the systems map of the city of Guelph. And as uh, I know, it's sort of um, might be hard to see on the screen. It's a bit complex, um, but that's ultimately how systems are. They are complex. What it shows is uh, immigration, um, integration, settlement services overlaid with the local labor market. And it shows the different connections between the key players and the different services that exist. And that includes the largest um, employers in the city and um, what their needs and what their labor market gaps were in terms of um, hiring people. So as you can see on the left side is settlement services. Uh, we have one, sorry, in the city of Guelph, there was one immigrant uh, settlement service agency, but there were several employment agencies that serviced immigrants uh, to help them integrate into employment. We had one school that offered language services. Um, there was a local immigration partnership that is situated in the city of Guelph. And there is also a workforce planning board that was regional to the Waterloo, Wellington, uh, region. So it wasn't in right in the city of Guelph, but it was part of um, a larger regional service. On the labor market side, there are uh, three large um, manufacturing companies that the way they stakeholders described it, they vacuum up all the labor supply um, in the city. So the uh, stakeholders that we interviewed discussed how if somebody wants a job and they arrive in Guelph, they can have a job. But it's the type of job that they can access that would, would might not be ideal for everybody who is uh, coming into the city. 
So some of the challenges that were identified uh, from our stakeholder interviews and from the systems mapping technique uh, um, was that there was sort of this episodic and limited funding uh, for immigrant settlement and integration services. And this might sound familiar to many of you that work in small and mid-sized cities, that there is large competition um, uh, for funding and that often smaller centers don't have the same capacity to compete against uh, some of the larger urban centers for that funding. Other areas they identified was there a lack of timely data. So there, we do know that IRCC does provide uh, regional data and you can find that data on the open source government platforms. However, people living in small and mid-sized cities and in these settlement service agencies, um, many times there aren't the staff or there isn't the skills and knowledge available to access that data um, readily and in a timely way that can be applied uh, sort of on a daily or monthly basis in, or, in order to plan accordingly for immigrants who may be arriving. There was also some uh, issues related to reaching all immigrants uh, because uh, the settlement service providers that we spoke to didn't have access to timely data. They felt like they didn't know who was coming into the city and when they were arriving. And then they felt there was a gap there and some immigrants were falling through those cracks. Uh, from the employer side, there was a discussion about an inadequate supply of local labor and how to tap into sources of supply, especially immigrant supply as they enter the city. And then the settlement service sector, interestingly, talked a lot about having this frayed connection with employers, that it wasn't an integrated or streamlined relationship between settlement services, employment agencies, and uh, the local employers who were looking for labor. So with all these challenges came opportunities. Um, I think that the few here are highlight sort of uh, the overall themes that emerged from our, our speaking with the different stakeholders. So coordination and connectivity between all the moving parts was one area that they identified as being an important area. Uh, increased flow of communication, the flow of expectations and a feedback loop that would uh, then provide uh, better coordination and integration for, for newcomers as they come into the city. Service providers also talked about uh, creating connections to employers, but to employers that were outside of the manufacturing sector so that they could support their skilled immigrants that were coming in and not looking for a job in a factory. And then supporting different employer-based initiatives. And I think many, uh, many people on the line would know about um, the Danby approach where uh, uh, Jim Estel had brought in refugees into the city and supported them in finding employment and becoming um, independent uh, fairly quickly within their first year of employment, I mean, of integration. Okay, so I uh, won't spend too much time on the demographic data of our immigrant uh, 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 interviewees, but I do want to talk about their pathway to commensurate employment. And many of the immigrants talked about uh, going through these different stages when looking for employment. They felt like they had some control over searching for jobs, but that they didn't feel very confident in um, navigating the local labor market. And so what happened in the end was that many would take any job that came available, uh, waiting for uh, or trying to uh, create professional networks in order to find the job that would be commensurate with their uh, skills and qualifications. So in conclusion, I just wanted to say that in mid-sized cities, uh, uh, local matters, really cities outside of Canada's three largest urban centers lack infrastructure and capacity to provide the essential services to newcomers. In mid-sized cities, relationships are important and community engagement is essential. Um, and so I think that in some areas there's room for improvement and city of Guelph was one of those areas. I also argue that in su success in small and mid-sized cities requires targeted planning and innovative community-based strategies unique to the local context where we're integrating all the key players and actors. So where this can happen, where the change can happen, while well, the enhancement of pre-arrival services is one area, uh, improvement to uh, regional data to support local planning, engaging employers and targeted immigration strategies, formalizing the strategy at a municipal level and continuing to invest in the LIP infrastructure uh, with increased collaboration between larger and smaller centers. So I'll leave it there. I'm, uh, did I hit my time, Louisa? Yes, you're right on 30 right. minutes. Right 30 on. Seconds okay. over, <laughs> okay. but it was well done. Thank okay, you well, thank much, you. Mary.
So we're jumping right away to our second presentation, which I will do. And thank you, Mary. Uh, our uh, presentations are very complimentary. I will speak more about newcomers experiences, perspectives and uh, strategies. So thank you also, Mary, for giving us uh, the context. And I think our four presentations today will be very complimentary. So you went over some of the main challenges around newcomer, um, newcomers' experiences on the labor market. In our study, which is based in the Ottawa Gatineau region, the place-based elements are also very, very important, but we have a very, very different context. The Ottawa Gatineau's labor market uh, region is dominated by uh, public administration because of the federal government. And it's also quite unique because of its interprovincial uh, region with the border between Quebec and Ontario and the prevalence of bilingualism, both because of the geography, but the presence of the federal government. So the experiences of newcomers is very different because there's basically no manufacturing. So low income jobs are mostly service related uh, jobs. In that sense, Ottawa Gatineau can be considered a post-industrial city uh, because it has no manufacturing and uh, knowledge-based economy is very much what the federal government is striving. It's also a second tier city. So in that way, our presentations are quite aligned. But in this case, this second tier city is also different because it has the highest median income in the country because of the presence of the federal government and tends to attract immigrants who have very, very high levels of education. A colleague of ours, Brian Ray, um, wrote a report where he did uh, a census analysis of immigrants' occupations by uh, gender, region of origin, and um, also time of arrival. And he shows that the labor market is very segmented and gender, region of origin, and type of occupation play a huge role in the process. So I'm sorry, I forgot to say that this presentation is based on a project I did with my colleague, Christina Gabriel from Carleton University, and it was funded through the BMRC partnership, Building Resilience in Canadian Cities. So Brian Ray's report was part of that partnership. Building on Brian's report, because his was very quantitative, our project uh, provided a complementary qualitative approach, and we wanted to look at the role of language and gender in skilled worker uh, newcomers' experiences in navigating this very unique labor market. Our project was delayed because of the pandemic, so we also added the pandemic element and our findings show that the pandemic further constrained uh, newcomers' experiences, and these are some of the findings that we wanted to show. So we'll show a number of strategies newcomers developed, in particular the role of settlement services, of social networks, and using social media because of the pandemic context from which we can maybe learn in order to tweak and improve both uh, settlement services to support employment for newcomers, but also some other uh, more fine-tuned strategies based on the individual needs of newcomers. The broader project uses social resilience as an approach. Uh, the entire partnership um, worked to develop social resilience as a promising framework to understand newcomers' experiences, but by putting the stress on the institutions that are available on play, depending on the place where they are. So we have developed through the partnership, through colleagues like Valerie Preston, um, a perspective on social resilience that stresses the transformative capacities of individuals, groups, and social institutions when dealing with challenges. So it recognizes not only resilience as individual responsibility, but in terms of power relations, structures, and institutions that are part of the system that is there to support those individuals or groups. 
so quickly our methodology uh, was qualitative uh, building on the partnerships it's a collaborative approach and local settlement agencies and the local immigration partnership were part of our advisory table we conducted semi-structured interviews with recently arrived skilled workers, that is people who had been in Canada for five years or less through the skilled workers or economic migrant stream, but also family reunification. We tried to ensure to have a good representation of men and women and newcomers who had English or French or both as a first official language through varied skilled occupations and our analysis was done through multiple stages uh, using in vivo. So briefly the demographic profile of the participants to stress the diversity we uh, were able to reach a good participation of both men and women. Um, unfortunately recruiting francophone or French-speaking participants proved very challenging during the pandemic. So English-speaking participants are somewhat overrepresented. Some arrived uh, about a year, maybe two years before the pandemic, but we also had many who arrived during the pandemic. So their experiences are slightly different. They were very diverse in terms of origins. And I like to stress the highly international profile of the participants Many had lived in, in other countries or studied in other countries or worked before coming uh, to Canada. And we had a number of them who were speaking multiple languages, including English and French. So we won't speak about language that much today in the presentation, but this is another angle that we're using to examine newcomers' experiences uh, through the lens of, of language and bilingualism. So briefly, I will let you know a little bit about the impacts of the pandemic, the challenges they face stressing the role of the pandemic, and then I will focus mostly on newcomers' labor market strategies. So as I said, we noted in terms of the impacts of the pandemic that the time of arrival, whether it was before the pandemic, so several months to a year compared to those who arrived during the pandemic, made a difference among our participants. In particular, those who arrived before were able to get their bearings, um, get, go to um, start becoming involved through activities, services, um, everyday life, whereas those who arrived during the pandemic, especially at the time of, of lockdowns, uh, faced significantly more barriers in terms of getting to know Canada. Some of them said, uh, and this is one of the most uh, strongest quote, that they didn't know Canada without COVID, without the pandemic. So for them, the first year or so was marked by lockdowns, which significantly hindered their ability to get to know Canadian culture and society. In terms of the challenges, as Mary um, explained, um, they faced a range of the normal challenges, including Canadian experience, uh, lack of familiarity with local labor market um, uh, structures, um, issues with the Canadian workplace culture, as well as training or accreditation recognition. But because of the Ottawa got no dynamics and bilingualism language um, was flagged as a significant barrier because there are requirements in the Ottawa got no region to be bilingual in Canada's official languages, so French and English. And then some mentioned the pandemic being a significant challenge and others refer to social networks or various types of discrimination of the labor market. So some, as I said, flagged really the pandemic as being an additional barrier exacerbating existing challenges. So in this uh, quote, one of the participants refers to the Canadian experience but noted that everything takes longer or is more difficult or more challenging because of the pandemic, including the fact that businesses had been closing or due to the uncertainty, wouldn't want to risk to hire people. So they faced additional challenges uh, because of the pandemic that compounded the impact. 
aspects of what normally they would live or that we know um, their experience entails. So I'd like to spend a little bit more time discussing the strategies they deployed. Uh, they deployed a variety of strategies that Mary actually also already flagged, but I'd focus on three that we found more significant or interesting, particularly due to the COVID and the pandemic context that maybe are uh, can inform future um, services, supports, or strategies. So these include using supplement services, uh, relying on social networks, and internet and social media. In terms of services, a large share of our participants did uh, contact settlement organizations or use their services, participated in the programs. The majority of those who did said they found them very useful, especially preparing their CV in the Canadian format, learning how to do cover letters, um, learning to do uh, interviews in the Canadian context, learning more about the labor market, as well as um, having access to databases to apply for jobs um, through the programs that they, they had participated. So in particular, and here's where the gender comes in, a number of our participants uh, participated in a special program, a pilot project that IRCC deployed through world scales that targeted newcomer visible minority women. And these women, the majority of them got a job very soon, a few weeks or a month or two after completing the program. And they all spoke very uh, eloquently about how useful that hands-on pilot project was and the fact that they were able to, to land uh, a job. I, speaking with one of the managers, I also found out that they were able to switch to online during the pandemic. And for many women, this actually became a benefit because they could stay home with the children and participate in the program without actually having to go. So here is an example of a, of a program that is very useful at targeting those who often are most discriminated, newcomer visible minority women. And the benefit of providing this program online contributed to their success in the labor market. In contrast, a few men actually weren't very happy with the settlement services. They said they used them, but they didn't find them useful because um, they were too generic. And it might be due to their occupation where they felt um, the services they got weren't really um, good at specializing for their specific occupation and the needs for finding a job in their occupation. Um, sorry. Um, Moreover, a few participants spoke to the fact that they disliked the online services during the pandemic. In particular, one participant spoke of the online job fair. So in person, some participants said the job fairs had been wonderful and great. So one participant got the job at the job fair that was in person. But this participant said they, they found the online job fairs horrible because it was just presentations and they couldn't really network with uh, the companies or uh, the, business, the business owner. So um, then I, quickly, I wanted to speak about the social networks. Among the participants, there was a perception that having networks was essential to get a job, including family and friends. So I have a quote. The first quote is someone who had, um, through their husband, networks in Ottawa. Some spoke about the usefulness of ethnic or religious uh, networks. So that's a second quote in the Brazilian community of how they were very connected. And thirdly, someone spoke of professional networks. So she tried to develop professional networks and that's how she was able to make a connection and then land a job. So they combined in some cases, social networks with the use of internet and social media, including using social media to build professional networks. A lot of the participants turned to the internet and social media, including LinkedIn, Facebook, WhatsApp, and so on, 
especially those in the STEM field, and they found them really useful. So those who were reluctant about the settlement services found they preferred doing searches on the internet, and that was a lot more uh, productive uh, for them, but this was not the case for everyone. So we'll end very soon. So here is a quote from uh, a participant who explained how they use LinkedIn to network. And in fact, even before coming to Canada, they were able to connect with uh, someone I got a job offer before landing in Canada. So we found that the STEM related occupations and those who were comfortable with social media and the internet had some advantages. We also found that they use different social media for different purposes. So LinkedIn was mostly for network building, Facebook, including Facebook for through ethnic communities was for advice and information and WhatsApp served for advice, information and contacts. And here's an example of some participants who didn't enjoy using social media. They had used them, but they found they were not productive. So to conclude, I wanted to illustrate the multiple strategies, uh, the significant role of settlement services, but also perceptions of how useful settlement services are, especially along the lines of gender and professional occupation. We found that few participants had used pre-arrival services, which is unfortunate. The pandemic underlined some specific needs and variations and the significance of time of arrival, occupation, social networks and language. And I hope through our findings to have shown how services or strategies can be improved. And I'm running out of time, so I'd like to thank my uh, colleagues, the BMRC partnership, and uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I'm, exiting now so that our next speaker, Neil, can uh, present. So Neil, it's to you. For people who have just joined the panel, we'll do all four presentations and we'll take questions um, after. So our next speaker is Neil Amber Judge, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at Wilfrid Laurier University. And he's also involved with the International Migration Research Center at the Belzili School of International Affairs. So Neil, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, so my uh, presentation is about international students from India. And I look at their uh, labor market experience and I focus on their expectation and aspirations of uh, coming to Canada. And so this is part of my research, PhD research that looks at uh, Indian student migration to Canada. And I uh, look at uh, the gen various gender dimensions and geographical dimensions of Indian student migration. And I mostly focus on understanding the source region in India that is primarily, I look at uh, North Indian state of Punjab where, which has a historically been a dominant source in India uh, as a migration source to Canada and presently also a significant number of students come from Punjab. And I've completed my data collection and, um, and I've interviewed students, international students in Canada, prospective students in India, and migration intermediaries or agents in India. And I've, yeah, uh, and I've uh, used Statistics Canada data. I've also used online survey and also interviews. Uh, so, uh, so international students have been increasing to Canada over uh, over the years, and 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 reached about like eight hundred thousand uh, in uh, twenty twenty two. And Indian students uh, now make up the largest proportion, and in twenty twenty two they make up made up about forty percent of all international students to Canada. And it has significantly risen over the decade. 
And so a little bit about background. So inter attracting international students, uh, promoting international education has been a strategy of Canada initiated uh, a decade ago. And, uh, and we also see over the years, like there's a huge reliance of higher education institutions in Canada on fee paying international students and they pay a lot five to four to five times more uh, tuition fees than domestic students. And uh, uh, and we also see that government funding and provincial funding of uh, education, higher education institutions have decreased. And we see that largest decline in Ontario, which attracts the largest number of uh, students from 42% a decade ago to 21% in 2019 and 20. And so uh, colleges in Ontario uh, exceed enrollments of international students and the universities only province in Canada. And they uh, contribute to huge revenue and also make up about 50% of student body. And we also see immigration system in Canada relying on three-step process that students for come, first come here and then uh, apply for postgraduate graduate work permit, and then they apply for permanent residence. And so, um, uh, so, uh, so greater number of uh, like sixty seven percent of principal uh, applicants in economic class were earlier international students or temporary foreign workers, and this trend has been growing uh, since. 2010 significantly increased uh, the three-step process, two-step process of migration. And we also see that international students are also become a huge source of labor and they especially end up in low wage labor market. And, um, and also uh, recently Canadian government has allowed international students to work for more than 20 hours a week during their duration of this their study, and um, and so uh, the theoretical framework for for overall for my research uh, looks at migrants, individuals, and family uh, agency and their decision making process. So I especially uh, look at the new economics of labor migration, which talks about that migration is a family strategy, family decision-making process, uh, and also use intimate geopolitics to understand source regions like Punjab and how they uh, are shaped uh, migration patterns. Uh, even the migration industry is shaped by transnational processes or its connection with immigration policy in here in Canada. And uh, so looking at student background, uh, so uh, in my interviews with immigration intermediaries, they would highlight that majority of students were young between 19 to 21 years, and mostly they had just completed 12th grade in India. And, uh, and majority were going for like uh, undergraduate or postgraduate diploma courses across mainly towards colleges across Canada. And some of the popular programs were hospitality management and IT. And also uh, it, very importantly is that migration agents help them in their choice of programs. So there is a also an intricate connection with college admissions and migration agents uh, uh, providing student recruitments to colleges in Canada funneling them to specific programs. Uh, so students have long-term long expectations in Canada and, and the opportunity to work after graduation and permanent residence is an important uh, factor in choosing to study in Canada. And, uh, and uh, for one student, like other destinations were considered like US, US, but UK and US, but uh, Canada, uh, because Canada has more clear uh, pathway for students to get 
uh, work permit after the, um, after the study is a huge motivate uh, is, is a huge factor to choose Canada then uh, compared to other study destinations and also students have long term uh, plans even after securing permanent residence taking into account uh, permanent residence and plans after that so students would share that uh, they would uh, also may uh, go for a master's degree or other professional program after securing a PR because the tuition fees uh, would be much less. So, uh, so such strategies to uh, increase their qualifications. So, uh, so students in India have high expectations regarding work and uh, intermediaries from India, they would share that students uh, would not really ask them about how the economy is in Canada right now, or whether, whether they'll be able to get a job once they complete their course. But these questions come up and for European countries. Uh, but students in Canada and in India are concerned about finding relevant jobs in their field of study, especially students uh, interviewed in Canada. Uh, so that's an issue. So I think, uh, and also uh, social networks are also uh, important uh, aspect in terms of economic outcomes and economic integration for students and finding jobs. So, um, so a lot of students had shared that they had friends or call classmates of their own age group who are already in Canada on study permit or the classmates from school who are planning together to to apply for Canada. So, so social networks, I think it's. Uh, very relevant in this case. Um, so, and I think, and also role of family is also very important because this decision-making process is, uh, is uh, the family plays an important role in the decision-making process. And also families have the kind of expectations that students uh, uh, may find them to be not, uh, commensurate to the reality here in Canada and sometimes uh, family, parents or even extended family have certain ideas and expectations about Canada, but students do face very tougher and challenging uh, time in Canada studying, working and managing everything on their own. And also uh, 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 um, from my online survey uh, found out like, so 35% of Indian students in Canada said they send money to their parents in India. And from interviews, they some felt that the, it was their responsibility and yeah, to, to contribute to the family uh, financial situation. And 91% of all respondents, uh, they said that they plan to work or uh, they plan to work or will work uh, part time to support their studies in and stay in Canada. And about 60% of Indian international students in Canada said that their parents or families did not contribute towards their uh, monthly expenditure while studying in Canada. So these are our results from my uh, the online study that I did from my uh, from my research. Um, so in conclusion, like students uh, have long-term plans of work and settlement in Canada and families play uh, a, an important role in the decision-making process. And but students uh, uh, have to navigate family expectations and also economic realities in Canada. And also we find that stu international students uh, are increasingly involved in low skilled jobs in Canada and uh, and they have concerns about finding relevant work that uh, that is related to their uh, study or what they uh, expect uh, in their line of uh, study and work so that's a challenge thank you thank you very much Neil you were yes at 10 minutes and I'll invite Janaina 
to join us as well. So the Janaina is doing the last presentation for today's panel on um, innovation opportunities and newcomer integration. So Janaina Nazari Gomez is a postdoctoral researcher fellow at the Institute of Official Languages and Bilingualism at the University of Ottawa. And if I'm not mistaken, she'll also speak about the Ottawa Gatineau region. So Janaina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Louisa. So yes, absolutely. Uh, our presentations are all complimentary. Um, I'll be talking about, especially about uh, francophone immigration and uh, their experiences uh, into the labor market. Data I'll be sharing with you today um, is um, from a, a study I'm conducting at the University of Ottawa. Um, uh, entitled The Linguistic Landscape Facing Immigration, a study in the ca national capital region, so Ottawa Gatineau region. Um, I'll go uh, briefly through the theory and methodology of the study, uh, talk about the recruitment of participants and the social demographic uh, profiles. Uh, and after that, I'll share with you the preliminary results of this study and draw some conclusions for discussion later. Uh, just for starters, the concept of linguistic landscape, it uh, refers to written and spoken and heard languages in a particular space, usually public spaces. And written, I'm talking about billboard signs, advertisements and everything. Um, and what previous research shows showed is that linguistic landscapes, so the linguistic environment, uh, have um, has a, a huge impact on the settlement process of francophone newcomers. Uh, this is especially important here and in Ottawa Gatineau, because as Luisa said, of the uh, inter-provincial um, uh, characteristics of the region. So we have Quebec, uh, a francophone majority over there, and here in Ontario, uh, 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 um, supposed bilingual, but mainly uh, anglophone majority. So this study um, is essentially qualitative um, and I'm, it's a non ongoing study. So I'm still interviewing newcomers. Uh, I'm aiming at 60 uh, people um, and we, we do a social, social demographic profile. After that, we have the proper interview. So questions about language, language use, uh, their linguistic perceptions of the region, how languages help or do not help uh, with integration. And after that, I asked them to elaborate a sociolinguistic map. So essentially to draw their experience here in Ottawa, Ottawa Gatineau. Uh, this study is also uh, comparative. So um, I'm aiming at uh, 20 newcomers that who have French as their first official language spoken, 20 uh, who have English, and 20 bilingual. So I'd be able to compare the um, the experiences uh, and how languages actually help or um, or or don't uh, the settlement process. Uh, what I'm sharing with you today is a uh, preliminary result. So um, I've done uh, 40 interviews until now, but I'm, I just analyzed 35 uh, profiles and, um, and that's uh, the data I'll be uh, talking about. So uh, a quick word about the recruitment process. Um, and the selection criteria. Um, so immigrants who arrived in the region from outside Canada within the last 18 months at the moment of the data collection, so at the moment of the interview, 
and um, uh, immigrants who uh, came through all migratory categories. So economic studies, studies, uh, it's um, new, it's people who came um, as a student, but as an immigration strategy, family reunification and humanitarian. All ages, uh, three different linguistic profiles, and recruitment uh, was is being made by uh, through social media, especially through uh, Facebook, ethnocultural groups, service providers, and referrals. So a friend of a friend of a friend who contact me and um, uh, uh, expresses his, their will to participate. So um, about this sample, uh, the 35 people um, uh, whose data I'm um, bringing to you today. So I try to have a, a balance uh, of gender, gender. Uh, the countries of origin. So Morocco, Algeria, Brazil, France, Colombia, Chile, Romania, Vietnam, Togo, UK, Syria. Uh, it's already a diverse um sample but i'm uh, i'm trying to go more diverse uh to be able to have different experiences um a, all participants have uh, are um between 25 and 45 years old and they mainly came um through economic uh categories uh so uh express entry um working holiday visa but also international students family reunification and for um refugees uh three refugees and one uh, asylum seeker um about their linguistic profiles so um 14 have french as the only first official language spoken and i say only is because uh, immigrants are usually multilingual. Uh, 11 have only English as the first uh, official language, eight bilinguals, and two people who don't speak either French nor English. Um, most of my sample is highly educated. And as uh, Louisa said about her sample, uh, they have international experiences and they as I said, they are multilingual. So uh, mostly on uh, people who have um, a master degree, but also undergraduate. And interesting enough, uh, most of them are unemployed. Uh, they are looking for a job. Uh, three are students and only 10 are actually employed. So uh, about the results, the findings, I'll go, um, I'll talk about um, the general perceptions of uh, the linguistic dynamics here in the capital region. And after that, I'll go specifically into um, the uh, Francophone newcomers economic integration. So uh, in terms of general perceptions, and when I say general, uh, I in this uh, for this specific slide, I gathered uh, uh, the three uh, information from the three linguistic profiles. So uh, Francophone, Anglophone and uh, bilinguals. But it's a rather consensus that uh, the region of Ottawa Gatineau actually is not uh, bilingual. It's actually uh, it's a false bilingual bilingualism. Uh, so Ottawa is uh, more anglophone, uh, mainly an English speaking city, while Gatineau is um, mainly a francophone. Um, but federal, provincial, and municipal services are um, accessible in both official languages. So newcomers, they, um, they acknowledge that, that services are provided in both offic official languages. So 
um, the um, French or English majority is um, located in the social sphere. sphere. So um, uh, restaurants, uh, uh, pub, uh, services, general services, uh, supermarkets, etc. And also settle, they recognize that settlement services are accessible in English and French, but also in some heritage languages. Uh, we are, Canada is receiving more and more um, uh, refugees and asylum seekers who do not speak um, official, the official languages. So um, service providers are more and more uh, being able to offer um, translation and other kind of services. But uh, another uh, perception is that English is essential for social integration in Ottawa and French is essential for social integration in Gatineau. Uh, I know this may seem um, uh, obvious for people who live here, but from for the newcomer um, uh, who has just um, the like, uh, just information, just publicity, advertisements, um, uh, targeting immigrants, uh, this kind of information, of actual information, is not obvious. Um, and I'll talk about that later. So uh, another important um, uh, factor or um, factor uh, is that the um, their willingness to, tra to, to transmit uh, languages to the second generation, so to their kids, changes um, according to the um, linguistic profile. So English-speaking immigrants, they see bilingualism as an asset, and they want their, their children to speak at least uh, three languages, while French-speaking immigrants are mostly divided in, into two trends. So some of them see French and their mother tongue as identity components, so they will um, make sure that their children go into Francophone schools, for instance, but another group actually has a preference for English, uh, because they are afraid of exposing their children to too many languages, and I miswritten to its uh, T O O. So these perceptions are actually um, very important in the way they behave uh, during the settlement process. Um, and now I'll uh, speak uh, specifically about francophone newcomers. Um, so, uh, the kind of publicity made by, for instance, IRCC outside Canada is that um, actually uh, newcomers are able to live in French. Um, and uh, if they don't do proper um, research before coming to Canada, or even sometimes they do proper research, they are they land here and they have some expectations um, about um, a big Ottawa being a bilingual city. Uh, once if you have two we, minutes, two minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, once they land in Canada, they uh, feel a huge disappointment, and they say, "I have the impression. I'm I'm under the impression that." I have been so a uh, dream. Um, and then they have to reorganize drastically all the settlement, the settlement strategy, which means usually that uh, the women who used to work in their um, country of origin will stay home to take care of children while the um, the husband, the, the spouse will be working or taking English classes to be able to enter the labor market. Uh, so they realized once they landed that uh, Ottawa is uh, um, uh, a um, it's it has a majority of English 
uh, speakers and English is essential to the labor market. Uh, there is a gap uh, between their actual English proficiency and the needed proficiency. So they sometimes they think that they speak enough English to be able to enter the labor mar market and they actually don't. Um, Francophone um, newcomers, they stay unemployed uh, for a longer period of time and they are fired more often because their linguistic, um, uh, their proficiency is not enough for the job they are doing. And they need to adopt a drastic de-skilling strategy. So as an example, a skilled worker uh, with a ma master's in marketing who was an executive in a multinational company back in his uh, in, in their uh, country, uh, uh, they send a um, hundred job applications um, and uh, after six months unemployed, uh, they decided, I'm using the, to not identify the person, but they decided to uh, work in a supermarket. Uh, what this situation uh, makes them uh, wonder about or quickly decide changing professional path. So the same, the same person who has a master's in marketing uh, is wondering about uh, going into education. Um, so in conclusion, um, the bilingualism in Ottawa Gatineau is actually, um, it exists, but it's a separate bilingualism, which was um, called by Monica Heller, um, a parallel bilingualism. So there is English, there is French, they don't mix. You, you can't use French and English uh, um, everywhere, in especially in Ottawa, Ottawa in Gatineau, um, uh, the economic integration is mediated by a, 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 a strong contradiction. So newcomers they uh, hear the discourse about shortage in the labor market, the the need for skilled workers, uh, but they are skilled workers and they are unemployed. Um, and uh, some needs that were already um, addressed uh, in the other presentations are uh, about um, information on Ottawa gets, you know, sociolinguistic reality. So what's bilingualism really like? Um, how the labor market is are not bilingual. Um, information on language proficiency requirements for the labor market and for service providers. Um, uh, I, I see the need um, for targeted English training. So not only uh, basic English classes, but um, according to each professional field. Thank you, Louisa. Thank you to you. Thank you, uh, everyone. The presentations are indeed quite complementary and address really uh, very timely issues. So we'll open the floor to the Q&A period. There is already one question that we received in the chat. In the meantime, um, the audience can ask us questions through the Feedloop platform in the Q&A uh, section that is in a corner. I don't know if it's on the right or the left. I don't uh, recall. So we have a question for Sarah from Sarah Wayland. Hello, Sarah. Thank you for attending. And it's probably targeted to Neil. Does Canadian education help international students to find better jobs, or do many of them remain in low-skilled work? Thank you for the question. Uh, so um, so I think uh, they, they do remain in low-skilled jobs, but, uh, but regarding Canadian education system, uh, it's, uh, it's more important that students are going to uh, courses, uh, that are more aligned to their previous uh, study and uh, like what type of course are they going. So, and, and for a lot of students, the primary purpose is to 
uh, to get into Canada and after maybe remain in Canada and study is a pathway to 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 and to have a permanent migration in Canada. So, uh, so a lot of students are uh, uh, not exactly uh, maybe uh, in programs that may help them. Uh, and maybe uh, like, uh, like one example I shared, they may have, uh, after maybe securing permanent residence, they may go to further, like going for master's program or other skill program that they think they, that would be, that would help them for better qualifications. But, but overall, there is, a, there is a huge difference. There is a huge challenge to students finding relevant work. Yeah, so if I may add, because with, with Margaret, we um, did a, uh, a study, there are issues of contradictions because international students are here to study and their conditions for the two-step migration where they have to show professional experience in their field and to get, I don't remember if it's the, for the express entry, they need to show at least one year full-time employment in their field, which is in contradiction with the fact that they actually come here to study. So there, yeah. there are challenges, um, but in, in some cases, international students do end up because they have uh, references or experience and Canadian degrees, it can help them. But it depends, as you said, on the stream, if they're college level, university, if they do undergraduate or postgraduate, so there are a lot of variations. So, Neil, do yes. you also have a question? Your, your hand no, no I, it was, I read did it by mistake. So, uh, yeah, that, that's true. And also, I think uh, the it's also become a huge business for Canadian higher education, especially colleges. You have private colleges coming up in Ontario to offer courses for students, not thinking what, how, like in terms of overall system of international education, attracting students, maybe there needs to be more planned thinking how students would end up after study. So, yeah. Yes, it, it is challenging. And even in addition to, to the jobs, the whole two-step process is very challenging and, and complex and stressful because the timelines are very short from the time they graduate to apply. Yes. They need to show they have a job offer. So mm. it, the job is one thing. There are all uh, the other things in addition. And, and as you said, uh, it's become a huge assemblage now of, of actors where universities and colleges need the financial mm. support from the international tuition. So there's a huge benefit from the Canadian institutions perspective. Uh, but then some of the programs do not are, I mean, mm. there's a lot of fraud as we saw in, in the news recently, and some of the short term programs are, are not so good. Are there any other questions? If not, I have one for Mary. I was uh, wondering, oh, here's one that just came in from Yivi Su, wondering if there is a plan or studies exploring immigration experiences in other mid-sized uh, cities from other provinces. Um, so I, Actually, do not know. I, I know I have colleagues in, in Winnipeg and Moncton who study um, immigration, including Francophone immigration. I know uh, Julie Troulet, but I guess she's based in Calgary. I'm not sure if Calgary counts as a mid-sized city or not. I mean, it's larger than Ottawa now, but I know Leah Hamilton has been doing research. Vicky Esses did some research also on, on London, Ontario. There's some research out of Windsor. So there certainly is research and it would be good maybe for the next P2P conference for us to organize a broader panel with more diversity than Ontario based cities. And I know there is research emerging out of Quebec and doing Quebec comparisons with the other provinces is also very interesting. So hopefully this answers uh, the question, I guess it's the limitation of the virtual format. 
Um, so Mary, I was very interested in your uh, systemic um, approach and I was wondering, you know, who should be doing these you know, systemic studies? Should it be, for example, LIPS, Local Immigration Partnerships? Should it be IRCCs, its settlement agencies? And you know, how should we coordinate? It seems very useful to understand the, the, the system on a city base. And I think for Ottawa Gatineau, it would be amazing to do what you did. But who should be doing these studies? And, and you know, how can we then draw from them to, to improve? I'm thinking the LIPS would probably be the best placed stakeholder. Yeah, so I think that's a great question, and and we've uh, garnered some interest from quite a few other regions that have said, you know, this is an interesting tool. It's an important way to to evaluate this. I know we don't have a lot of time, but um, I, you know, in in my experience, I think it would be most beneficial in a co-design type of community engaged kind of approach. So you're looking at the LIP could be like the hub, but they also act as a key stakeholder. And I know they're not, you know, sort of immigrant serving in terms of the, the actual individual, they do sort of that larger um, um, stakeholder groups, but I think that they would still just be one actor in that larger system. And so I think it would come from, you know, this sort of uh, uh, coordination with the research but then also the community, uh, the municipality that at the city level, looking at um, the city itself, you know, really engaging the city itself. And I know some of the lips sit right in the city. So that you're, you're right, it would be a good starting point. But there are a lot of um, uh, smaller regions that don't have lips. And so, where, you know, where, where do they turn? And so it would be something where I think with the expertise, you would need sort of that research component, but then also having all those key players uh, at the table as well. And that it really is, it gives you this visual snapshot and identifies where those gaps are, where there might be, you know, there might be connections, but there'll be definitely connections lacking. And so how do we create this coordinated effort to improve the services and then go back to the government to go back federally, provincially, even municipally and say, you know, this is what's needed and how can we, you know, have the, the funding and, and uh, build the capacity locally uh, in terms of what works that's unique to that city or that organization or that uh, community. Yeah, especially in, you know, the current labor shortages and variations across regions in terms of the labor short, the supply and, and the demand, it looks like a very useful tool to better um, I mean, I'm not in favor of creating more pilot projects in the immigration streams, but it could be a way to better align the supply and the demand. So immigrants who arrive with uh, the labor needs uh, locally. So I'd be interested. So I hope to, to come by your, your poster session and, and talk to you more. I also wonder for the RIF, the, the French equivalent of the LIPS, the Réseau en Immigration, the Francophone Immigration Networks, I think they they could be very interested in in this so i'm looking forward to to hearing more about it great i guess our, Thank you, Lisa. our time is soon up but i see more participants have just joined um neil or janina did you have questions or comments i actually wanted to um uh comment on your presentation mary too because um I, i've been Lisa and I, we've been working together for a while now, and um, like the um, the importance of uh, locally based uh, solutions and research have always emerged. So your presentation was really uh, uh, helpful into confirming this hypothesis that um, uh, that. Uh, local um, reflection uh, is needed uh, and uh, actually uh, we used we are used uh, to talk about immigration as a large process which is when we think about Canada and Canada Canadian policy and everything but actually the the frames uh, in which immigration and settlement and uh, the occur are are different mm -hmm. uh, and each region Canadian region has it on like specific specificities okay and um, so yeah I just wanted to to I took I I, I, I made 
I took notes about your presentation, but I'd like us to discuss more because uh, it's really um, it's important um, to, to to have this kind of look in a more particular way. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. And and please e email me. We can talk and have more discussion. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So we have one more question, uh, Janaina. It's for the Ottawa Gatineau region. Uh, donc merci Adad pour votre question. It's regarding um, whether there are any strategies or programs, or good practices, or promising practices, I think we say in English, to help uh, newcomer francophones with uh, economic integration. So uh, Janaina, do you, I have a few ideas, but I'll let you answer first. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ada, Ida, for your question. Yeah, so um, basically, um, I'll just say something before answering your question directly, but uh, um, my research has shown that uh, francophone newcomers, they actually are um, divided about joining the francophone community or just going into, going into English because they realize that they need English to uh, live, to, 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 to meet basic uh, needs. So, um, so when Francophone communities, the ones that are historically there, they actually uh, welcome Francophone immigrants, it has a huge impact. So um, other than proposing activities, um, uh, there is like a, a more, a, a deeper um, uh, posture that Francophone communities may have, may adopt, which is based on thinking about who they are becoming with these new immigrants, these new newcomers. Who uh, are, what kind of community are they? the building um, with their historical roots and new uh, blood, new experiences, new, new languages, because Francophone also have uh, come with their uh, baggage of languages. So I think um, um, in order to have um, a, a, a lasting integration process, and a, a lasting um, uh, an integration in both ways. So um, uh, francophone communities um, and landed immigrants to really get to know each other and to live together and to maybe build a society, think about what kind of society they want to have. Um, this kind of, uh, of thinking and of exercise uh, can and should take place. So it's it was more of an abstract answer, but I think it lays the ground for concrete actions after that. Yeah, so I can provide a few more concrete actions. So in, in Ottawa, on a capital national, uh, there's La Cité Collégiale, so the local college, La Cité, who offers services, especially for employment to francophone newcomers. And we have one organization, CESOC, Le Conseil Économique et Social de Tawagatino. I know they work very closely with francophone employers. So La Cité organizes job fairs with the employers and during the job fairs is like speed dating where they have very short interviews and these have been quite successful in matching. And CISOC, I, I have spoken with one settlement uh, or employ, employment advisor where for each, um, each newcomer who's looking for jobs, she looks at the profiles and I remember she gave the example of someone who was um, a, a, a printer, so they travaillaient dans la presse, dans l'imprimerie, and she looked up all the printing companies in the in the region and spoke to them, and she realized all of them needed um, 
needed workers. And so she's able to match each person. So this is an example that was specific to the occupation needs of the person. She will look up. So it's very time consuming, and um, but that's the her strategy. And she seems to be very successful. So these are concrete examples. But I think having social activities where the Francophone newcomers can connect with the Francophone community is essential for the networking. And then eventually um, getting to know each other seems to be one of the barriers that can help among Francophones. Voila. We're over our, our time uh, by a little bit. So um, in order to respect, I guess, the timelines, thank you. We still have 30 participants, I guess, as included on the on the panel so if you have any more questions feel free to to wait and i thank everyone i thank um, all the panelists for this great uh, very complimentary presentations and i'm very much looking forward to connecting with you mary and and neil through through margaret uh, to discuss further i think there was really very um, interesting issues around the mid-sized cities and maybe for next year we can plan a, a panel that includes mid-sized cities from other provinces. So thank you very much everybody. Thank you. Thank you.